purpose of the Flick Reedy Education Enterprises is to promote individual moral responsibility through education. How do we do this? We study and discuss the interrelationships of history, philosophy, social studies, and economics. We do not dictate. We do not make statements as to what we think you should or should not do. We do not unduly burden this program with footnotes, references, or complete documentation. However, we do give sufficient data to bring this discussion into proper focus. We invite you to delve further into the necessary historical and statistical data to develop a deeper understanding of truth and a keener sense of individual moral responsibility. Hello, Americans. I have some things I'd like to share with you because I think they are of interest and concern to you. I don't pretend to know all the answers, but what and how much thought we give these matters will affect not only our lives, but the lives of our children and grandchildren and many others. Did you know that you are a very strange phenomenon on the face of the globe and in the pages of history? So am I. And you know why? because you and I probably have not missed a meal all this week. Let's see if we can find out why we are so blessed. Let's look at the record. Living in the United States today is like going to the theater in the middle of a play. Much action has already taken place. It's the story of people, almost 200 million of us, plus all those who have gone before us. For strangely enough, we are not only the audience, we are also the actors in this worldwide drama. We need to see how we fit into the story, what our part is, and what we can do to make the drama proceed better. Let's find ourselves in this drama. Among the leading nations of the world today, our United States is playing a starring role. While it may not have been formally planned that way, it did not just happen by chance. We must understand the difficult and demanding part our country plays. We must know the kind of drama being played on this worldwide stage. We must understand the purpose, the theme, the subjects and plot, and how we can play our parts better. The world has shrunk in our generation. The marvels of high-speed communication and jet travel have virtually eliminated distance and natural barriers. No longer can nations live in semi-isolation. Nowadays, what happens in one nation vitally affects the rest of the world. The drama of revolution in Cuba, famine in Red China, depression in East Germany, prosperity in West Germany, struggle in Vietnam, affects all the nations of the world, directly or indirectly. New ideas and desires push toward the light and in so doing, arouse antagonism and violence. There is the repeated pattern of situation, conflict, and climax, establishing the relationship between cause and effect. Cause and effect. That is what we must see if we are to learn from history. Cause is like the seed. Effect is like the fruit. It's easy to see the fruit. It's not so easy to see the seed. In a little more than 100 years, the United States rose from a weak, struggling republic of 13 colonies to become the leading nation of the world. Why and how did this happen? Let's check possible answers to the question. We have only 7% of the land area of the world and but 6% of the population. Do we have richer soil? more intelligent people, work longer hours, plant more crops per year? I believe you would say no. Did the Jamestown and Plymouth colonists find this abundance here when they arrived? Did they bring it with them? No, of course not. Are we so different from other people? For 60 known centuries, the Earth has been inhabited by human beings not much different than ourselves. These people had about as much physical strength as we do, and among them have been men and women of great intelligence. But down through the ages, most human beings have gone hungry. Millions and millions have starved to death. At least one of every two, and some historians put the figure as high as three of every four, 
have lived a shorter life due to lack of sufficient food. To the best of my knowledge, there has never been a famine in the United States. Why? The ancient Assyrians, Persians, Egyptians, and Greeks were intelligent people. But in spite of their brains and fertile lands, they were never able to get enough food to eat for all their people. Mothers frequently killed their babies at birth to keep them from starving to death later. Rome collapsed in famine. The French were dying of hunger when Thomas Jefferson was president, 1801 to 1809. And as late as 1846, the Irish were starving to death. And no one was particularly surprised. For you see, famines were the rule rather than the exception. Even in these times, famines kill multitudes in Red China, India, Africa, and Russia. In the 1930s, when we were having our economic problems here, what happened elsewhere? Millions and millions of people starved to death on the richest farmlands of the Soviet Ukraine. Why? Down through the ages, countless millions struggling unsuccessfully to keep bare life and wretched bodies have died young, in misery and squalor. Then suddenly, in one spot on earth, the course of history was reversed. Somehow, in this one spot, food is so abundant that the pangs of hunger are almost unknown. Yes, that was right here in these United States. Where else has so vast a majority of a nation's people enjoyed such a bountiful availability of food? Why did men starve for 6,000 years? Why is it that in these United States we have never had a famine? Why? Why did men, women, and children eke out their meager existence for six thousandly from dawn till dark, often barefoot, half-naked, unshaven, with lousy hair, mangy skin, rotting teeth, and with never enough to eat? Why? Never before in human history has a nation enjoyed such wealth, comfort, and leisure as we Americans now enjoy. Every day in thousands of places, men and women are thinking and tinkering to make available to you and me more, better, newer, to further enrich the years that we have on this earth. Thus, we, the laboring class, both blue shirt and white shirt, have been able to enjoy what only the most wealthy and privileged classes have in other lands, a home of our own, an automobile or two, electricity, telephones, TV, radios, washing machines, vacuum sweepers. Why is it that we in the United States have all this and people of other lands have so little in comparison? Why? Economists tell us that wealth, material wealth, is not measured by printed pieces of paper called money, but by the real goods and services we can obtain. Real goods and services can be created in only one way, and that is by the expenditure of human energy applied to natural resources, usually with the aid of tools. It follows, then, that how much we are motivated to use our human energy will determine the amount of real goods and services created and available to us. The key, or cause, of our abundance must somehow be related to the utilization of our human energy physical and mental. Economists and efficiency experts say that here in the United States we have achieved the greatest utilization of human energies in the history of mankind. How and why did we do it? A few minutes ago we observed that we do not have a disproportionate share of the Earth's natural resources. We further agreed that as individuals we are not physically stronger or more intelligent than others. In other words, our potential energy is probably about the same as other people, past and present. Well then, what has permitted us, as a nation, to achieve the greatest utilization of our available human energy, mental and physical? How and why have we discovered and are adapted so many tools to multiply our efforts? This is the question. When we have found the answer to this question, we shall have found the key to our abundance the cause and seed of our wonderful fruit. It's important that we know this answer, 
lest we lose this important ingredient? The answer is really very simple. So simple that many of us overlook it. Earlier, we eliminated all the possible reasons for our abundance, but one. I submit the answer is individual freedom, and that freedom is the mainspring of human progress. As nice as our abundance and material wealth may be, they are not half as important as the way of life that abounds within freedom. It is this climate of freedom that permits the expression of man's great spirituality. This expression of spirituality is perhaps the greatest benefit of freedom. We might even designate the material wealth and abundance as fringe benefits to the spiritual way of life with freedom. No, of course, we are not angels. But I'll stack us up against anyone else as measured by our adherence to a code of morals, ethics, and concepts found in the Bible. But what is this freedom that we are talking about? Lenin, Stalin, and Khrushchev said that the Russian people are free. Castro claimed he brought freedom to the Cuban people. How would you define freedom? Let's try this definition for size. Freedom is the absence of external human control or restraint over individual thought and action. I think you can see what kind of self-control and self-discipline is required for a great degree of individual freedom. Can an individual or group have great freedom of thought and action without a corresponding degree of responsibility for their thoughts and actions? For every ounce of individual freedom, man must assume an ounce of individual responsibility. Since the origin of our country, we and these United States have enjoyed more freedom than any other people anywhere, any time in history. We enjoy freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of peaceable assembly, freedom of privacy in our homes. We are free to go into business for ourselves, free to own property, free to work, free to compete. Yes, and just as important, free to fail and try again. We are a free people to the greatest degree ever known to man. But are we slowly but steadily giving up some of those freedoms, with our consent perhaps, in exchange for what we consider security? There is no guarantee that our abundance will continue. Neither you, nor your children, nor your grandchildren are assured this continued abundance, are assured even enough to eat, unless you and I do whatever is necessary to maintain and increase this mainspring of human progress, individual freedom. In my own way, I have presented my reasons for believing that freedom is the magic ingredient for providing a highly spiritual way of life which has included great material wealth and abundance. Do we want this to continue for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren? If we want freedom, we have to earn it, then guard it, generation after generation. It must be understood, then taught from parent to child over and over again. I guess if I were asked to sum all this up in just one short sentence, I would merely say, freedom is the mainspring of human progress.